the, the, the mechanics and, and the components, rather, is probably a better way to put it, of an Android application. And we also want to do uh, a little bit of Java review as we're doing this. Um, and my intent for today is to, to go through this. I, I'm pretty sure I remember where we left off. We left off just about looking at the button and putting the code associated with the button. So um, I'm going to review the stuff that we went over before. We're going to look at that code. Then we're going to try tweaking this a little bit because I think, in my opinion, when you uh, go in and tweak an application, uh, a lot of times that makes you, know, that, that, that makes you um, have to understand what's going on to, in, in it to, to, to make some changes. At least understand it on some level. So what we're going to do is First of all, if you have a machine and you have everything installed, if you want to download the code on your machine, it's available in Angel. So just go to Angel and under Lectures, there'll be a, a zip file called Example 4 uh, 9.3. So you can go and download that. Um, uh, that way when we, when we work on it, um, depending on, on how I feel, uh, again, if the first part of the day is any indication, I'm not exactly having a stellar day. Uh, but depending on how uh, I feel, uh, we'll either work on it together or uh, maybe you can work on it in groups, the alteration that I want you to make uh, to this page. At any rate, we're looking at this example. And this example, again, manifest is information about the application, nothing terribly interesting in that for now. We do set the icon in there. We do set the app name. Um, and we, we essentially tell it what to do when this fires up. We also set some things as far as like what the minimum version of this is uh, and so on. Do notice again that generally speaking our string, none of our strings are hard coded. So for example, the label that we want on the application is at string slash app name. What that, is, what that label is, is, whoa. This thing up here that says example simple tip calculator. All right. That is in the app name. All right. Which we don't have that hard coded. We point instead to our resources strings file, which is in the value section. So at string means find it in the resources strings file. And if we look, app name is example simple tip calculator. So that's why we see that text in up in the title bar of the application. So it'll be that way for all of our hard-coded strings and all of our hard-coded values. We're not going to be hard-coding any of them. We're going to have them in these strings files. And again, why do we do that? Um, that makes it a lot more maintainable. Um, if we want to make a change, we only need to make that change in one place and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, universally changed throughout the application. This, uh, again, has some good implications when we talk about internationalizing our, our app. Like if we want to write a, a version in French or Spanish. Because what we will do then is we will simply have a different strings XML file. And that file will get applied when um, the device is set to French or when the device is set to Spanish. So we don't have to mess with like any of our coding. The, the operating system handles that for us. Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually a good thing. Uh, again, a lot of times in programming, to the degree that we can separate things into distinct components, that really increases the maintainability because you can swap something out without messing something else up. So here we don't have to dig into the code and change the strings and all that. So we'll do this throughout the, uh, our, uh, you know, throughout our coding here. All right. In this strings file, we have strings for any of the labels that we use. And we also have our options for our drop down, which is level of service. Now that's a little bit different because it's not a single string, but it's an array of strings. All right. But in general, the idea works the same.
No, it's an example that, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier today, you can download off of Angel. Uh, this is the example that we looked at last time in class. All right. Similarly, the layout of this is also stored in an XML file. And you can either have sort of the GUI layout, which I avoid, the graphical layout, or you can look at the code for this. Linear layout, which there's, there's different types of layouts that you can have. If you remember in the very first example we looked at, there was a relative layout where you position one thing relative to some other control or some other component on the page. This is a linear layout, which simply means boom, 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 boom. They just stack on top of each other right down the line. All right. Now again, you know, we're, you, you know, you got to walk before you, you, you can run, as they say. This is a, a pretty simple layout. You know, it's just stacking the controls vertically on top of each other. Where the complexity comes in in some of the apps is the fact that you can, you know, nest layouts inside of other layouts, and therefore you can get any sort of, of kind of uh, design that you want. Um, again, we have our text view. We have, um, uh, that's, that's a label for our greeting message, which again, that the text of that is in our strings file. All right, under hello. And we have then uh, the edit text, which we set properties for. Indicate that it is uh, a number. Request focus indicates that this element will get focused when the application starts. We have a spinner control, which is roughly the equivalent of a drop down where you can choose among options. Finally, we have a button and a text view for the results. Notice for each of these, there's sort of a plus ID amount. What we're doing is we're adding to the resources a ID called amount that's going to point to this text control. So that when this XML file sort of comes to life and actually creates the screen running in the app and those objects are out there, that ID will be available for us to grab a pointer to that control. All right. Remember that component design like this offers a lot of big advantages. But you still have to make the components talk to each other. And there, there needs to be a hook between the components. In other words, how does our code refer to the text box that's in this XML file? Well, it does it via the ID. All right. Now, we talked before about resources. With strings, you can have different resources for language. For layout, you can have different um, layout files based on the screen size or the screen resolution. So we can play around and actually change the layout of this depending on the screen size or the screen resolution. So a bigger screen, we can devote more space to something. All right? Or we could add extra stuff or whatever. The drawable section has our icons. In this case, all we really have is an icon. And we have different icons to, that correspond to the different screen densities. And then we have our code. And this is where we left off last time. Looking at the code, again, we've created a package um, called edu Lorraine CCC dot CISS 268, which is actually incorrect. This is CISS 265. All right. But in there, we have our two classes. We have our activity class, and then we have our meal class. Again, this is a good programming practice. The activity class is going to be the class that sort of is the boss and sort of runs the show and sort of sets up the GUI. But the actual like logic or processing logic or business logic, if you will, actually resides in a, simple, uh, a separate class. All right. You don't want interface stuff and processing stuff tied up in, into one bundle because then it makes it harder to pull them apart. It makes it harder to change one and, and if they're very tightly uh, intertwined together. Again, we were looking at this 
last time, this is where we left off, we spent a fair amount of time looking at this statement. All right. This is in the onCreate method of this activity, which, as you would assume, is the activity that fires off when this application starts up. All right. We call super.onCreate, what we're doing is we're calling the ancestors code. All right. We're overriding this, but we're not really overriding it. We're calling the ancestors code and we're sort of appending on to that our code. So we want the framework to do everything it needs to do. That's why in many of these override you'll see super.onCreate. Um, remember that this particular class extends activity. Activity is not a class that I created. Activity is a class in the Android framework. And it has, as a class, it has its own sort of behaviors, it has its own attributes, and so on. By calling super.onCreate, what I'm doing is I'm making sure that the initialization of the framework stuff works correctly, and then I go and do my stuff. All right? What am I doing? First thing I do is I set the content view. All right? Set content view is a method that's associated with the activity class. And what it does, essentially, is it sets a screen associated with this activity. And where does it get the screen from? Gets the screen from R, the resources, dot layout, layout, main, that main XML. All right? So that's what ties, that's the hook that ties this layout to this set of code in this activity. All right. And again, if we had different screen resolutions or different sizes, if we had different layouts for that, then it would automatically get applied when, when we did this. So this statement here effectively brings this XML file to life and makes an actual screen out of this XML file. So it creates objects for this text view, and for this edit text, and for this spinner control, and for this button, and for this text view. All the controls on this page, all those views that are associated with that XML file, it brings to life and makes an object for it. One key concept in Java to make sure that we understand is the difference between a class and an object. Can someone give a definition between a class uh, or a de definition or description that helps explain what a class is and what an object is? Anyone care to take a stab? Yes. An object is a subdivision of a class. I don't know if I would put it exactly that way. I don't know if I'd say smaller than a class. In, in one sort of respect it is, but let, let's try to add to this. Okay. Class is a definition, and the object is an instantiation of it. Look at it this way. A class is sort of a template. It describes what members of that class can do that is the methods associated with that class. And it also describes what the methods, or, or rather what the members of that class know about itself. That is what the attributes are. All right? So the definition of a class defines like what this thing can do and what this thing can know. The object is an actual member of the class. It's one specific member of the class. So the Ob or the class is sort of the template, the definition. It's meant to be representative of all members of the class. That's why your statement that it's smaller sort of makes sense, but I just want to make sure that we are precise because the class represents everything of that particular class. An object represents one member of that. So, for example, if we were going to say that we had an application that had a people class in it, all right. Um, people would be the class. If we were to look around this room, 
there'd be six objects of type people in this class or of type person in this class. The definition of a class of person would contain things like people have birthdays, people have heights, people have widths, people have the place that they were born, people have names, people have addresses, and behaviors, you know, you know people eat, people can, um, you know, register to vote, people can, any number of different things. All the things that anyone can do, any person, any member of the class can do. And in the class definition, that's where we define those things, and we define the rules for that. But then when we talk about a specific person with a specific value for their birth date, and a specific value for the place that they were born, and all that, and engages in certain specific behavior, then we're talking about a person. All right? So... All these things in the layout XML file are going to get turned into objects. All right? What kind of object? Well, this one gets in, turned into a text view. This one turns into an edit text. This one turns into a spinner. This one turns into a button. And this one turns into a text view. Each one of these is its own object of the respective type that it is. So this will be an object of type text view. So it can do all the things that a text view can do. All right? We've described that this is a text view. So any characteristic of a text view, it has it. And any behavior that a text view has, it has it as well. Likewise with a button, likewise with the spinner control, and so on down the line. Now, we talked a little bit about inheritance, an inheritance is, to, to sort of review that, is where you have a thing can actually be a member of several different classes, right? And each class can be a little more specific. For example, we are all people, but we are also all mammals, right? And mammals have certain characteristics, you know, in common. We take it a step further, animals have certain characteristics in common. If we take it a step further still, Animals have things uh, in common. So animals won't have a social security number, but people will. All right? So when we define a subclass, we're saying that it's everything that's in this class plus some extra stuff. Or maybe it does some things in a different manner. All right? So all of these things in this XML file are going to get objects created for them of the different types. Yet all of these are views. They're just specific kinds of views. Now there's certain things that you can do to a view, regardless of the kind of view it is. And we'll take advantage of that in a couple minutes here. So, the XML file describes all the different objects that we're going to create when we bring this XML file to life. The text views, the spinner controls, the edit text, and so on. But keep in mind that these are also all views. So anything we can do to a view, we can do to any of these as well. So, when we set content view, we do it for this, and then all of a sudden all those text boxes and all that come alive and we actually have objects to it. We have those objects, but we need a way to point to them. And I mentioned that this... It's a very important statement, and we're going to see it in just about every application that we work on. What this is doing is, this is grabbing a pointer to that button. All right? This is grabbing a pointer to that button. How are we grabbing a pointer to it? We use that button's ID to grab a pointer to it. So if you notice here, we have a method that says find view by ID. That's a method that's associated with the activity as part of the framework. I didn't write this. This is the default method in here to find view by ID. And what it does is it grabs a reference to the particular view that has this ID. Where did we get that ID from? Well, we got it from... Whoops. 
this. Because when we created that button, we added an ID for that button called calc. So in our code, we say in our resources, the ID of calc. That's the view that I want to point to. This in parentheses says we know that that's a button and we want to treat it like it's a button. All right, that's known as casting. All right. So now, this variable called calc is, contains a pointer to that button object on that screen. And once more, once more, we know it's a button. We cast it as a button so we can treat it like it's a button. Remember, this find view by ID, we're going to use to find all sorts of views on our page. We're going to use the same function to find the edit text view on our page or the spinner control on our page and all that. But we don't want to treat these things like generic views because there's only some very basic things that you can say about general views. We want to treat this like the view that it actually is. In this particular case, we want to treat it like a button. Therefore, we need to cast this button control that we know it's a button, right? Because we made the XML file. We're saying treat it like it's a button. So now calc contains a pointer to that object. So anything we do to calc is referencing that object. All right? And I think this is where we left off last time. All right? Now what we want to do is we want to write some code that executes when that button gets pressed. All right. Now, there's a certain kind of name for the kind of methods that we invoke when some events happen, like when we press a button or when we type in text or, or something along that. All right. And that is called a listener. All right. So what we're creating is we're going to create a click listener object. What's the click listener's job? The click listener's job is to, is to execute the on-click event when that button gets clicked. So we're associating a new object whose job it is is to handle when that button gets clicked. So I have calc.setOnClickListener Alright, that's a method. And what it is looking for, and this code is a little bit hard to read, but if we look at the argument for this, it is looking for an on-click listener object. Okay, as the argument. In other words, we're going to assign an object whose job it is to handle the clicking of this button. Now, the thing about that object is, is this is not an object that is really important to keep track of. It isn't an object that we are going to reuse, for example. This object is tied to this particular application, this particular activity, this particular button. So therefore, we don't really need to create a class for it. We're not going to reuse it. So uh, what we've done is we've created something called an anonymous class. What's an anonymous class? An anonymous class is a class that doesn't really have a name. <coughs> All right. So for example here, we create a class of, that extends activity and call it example activity. This class, we're creating an object of Actually, this would be an anonymous object. We're creating an object of type view on click listener, but we're not giving any reference to it. We're not giving it a name that we can refer to it later or create, um, you know, reuse this in some other application or anything like that. Therefore, it's said to be anonymous. So if we look closely, everything in here, we're creating an object to handle the clicking. 
So if we look closely, what is our on-click listener for this button? It's a new object of type on-click listener. And we're defining the code between here and here. I actually didn't go quite far down long enough. So our class definition for this on-click listener, which is anonymous, right? We don't have any reference to it. We haven't given like a class name to it. The class definition extends from here to here. And therefore, what gets passed as the argument in this function is a new object, a new listener object, that we define from here to here. All right? So, let's look at what we do here. We've defined and we've said, what do we want to handle the clicking of this button. Well, I have this click listener object, a view on click listener object. And what is the code associated with it? Well, the code that's really interesting for an on click listener is the on click event. So I'm defining here the on click event for this click listener. So I'm creating a new click listener, and this is the on click event for it. All right. Again, this is part of the framework. On-click listeners have associated with it an on-click event with this signature that gets fired when someone clicks the object that it's doing the listening for. And what is contained in that on-click event? Well, I'm creating a new meal object. And we'll look at the meal object in a few seconds here, in a few minutes here. But the meal object is what actually has the tip calculation in it. Remember, we're separating out what our processing or business rules are from the code in the activity. The code in the activity is sort of just linking the components together, right? It brought in the, the GUI. It's hooking the GUI to the business object that does the actual calculation. So the first thing we do is we create a new meal object. The next four or five things we do is a duplicate of, or actually the next, yeah, next three things we do, is the same line that we did up there with the button. We use the find view by ID to find the, the view in our GUI that has this ID. And we cast it to the appropriate class that it belongs to. So for example, the thing that has an ID of an amount, that's an edit text. Therefore, we create an edit text and we cast that view to an edit text. All right. So if we look back here, That edit text has an ID of amount, so we find the thing that has the ID of an amount, we cast it as an edit text. Now we have a reference to that edit text object. So anything we do to E, we're doing to that text box, that edit text field. We do the same thing for the text view, we do the same thing for the spinner control. All right. I then grab the cost out of there. All right. An edit text, one of the features that an edit text has, is it, or one of the, the, the methods that it has, is there's a method to grab the text out of that edit text. So I am going to set the cost of the meal by grabbing the text from that. 
and converting it to a double. All right. I then set the cost of the meal to that cost. Likewise, I set the service level of the meal, poor, medium, or poor, average, or excellent, based on the value, the select item position, from that spinner control. Lastly, I call my meal object to actually calculate the tip based on those parameters. I grab the answer from it. Then finally, I set the text on the label, that text view, to the result of the tip calculation. Okay. Now, notice we haven't looked at anything about like exactly how the tip is calculated. This is the activity. There shouldn't be a lot of processing logic in the activity. The activity simply sort of coordinates the efforts of everyone else. Questions at this point? What are the important things in here going forward? All right. Keep in mind the way this class is structured, um, you know, we look at apps, but it's not just the specifics of the app that we're looking at. We want to look at general things that we can go and adapt to all the apps that we're going to run and, and apply. The things that are important in this snippet of code, besides all the other stuff about the other files that we talked about in previous classes, but about this particular code, the things that I want you to be aware of are number one, how we use statements like this to grab pointers to the objects. All right. This is our linkage between the objects that are created in that XML file and this code that we can go in and we can write code to manipulate those objects and use the values from those objects. So be sure you understand that statement and what that does because we're going to be using it all over the place. All right. That's the one thing to know. The second thing to realize is the notion of a listener. A listener, again, is an object that handles certain events that occur on other objects. In this particular click case, it's a click listener on a button. That means that this is a code that's going to handle and it's going to address what happens when that button gets clicked. All right. Now, if I already had another object created, if I already had a click listener object created, I could just assign it that object. But I don't, so I've created this anonymous click listener, which is simply a new click listener, and I define for that new click listener this on click event, which contains the code that actually gets executed. That code does very much what the other one does, is it grabs pointers to my different objects on the screen. It then creates a meal object and calls a method on that, gets the results, and sets the text of the label. So those two things, this find view by ID and casting that to the appropriate data type is one big thing. And the defining of a listener for the button is another thing that you really need uh, to, to do and to be aware of. The third thing is how this relates to um, what I want to say. How this relates to um, the class that contains the business logic. All right. This doesn't do the calculation of the tip itself. It simply calls the meal component. And again, it's another separation. We have our business logic and our interface logic in different places. All right. This meal class, which I've created, is meant to represent a meal. And ideally, in an application like this, I'd put everything that has to do with a meal in this class. All right. So I could put the, the tax amount for the meal, you know, and that would be calculated based on some rule. Was it dine-in or was it to go? Because depending on that, you get charged tax or you don't get charged tax. You could put 
other attributes. But in this particular case, the only attributes I'm really interested in is I'm interested in the cost and I'm interested in the level of service. All right? And the cost I define as a double. The level of service is an integer because what we're going to get is we're going to get the position in that array of the level of service. Did we pick option one, two, or three? And from that we'll use to calculate whether it was average or whether it was poor, average, or excellent. So, notice that these variables, these instance variables, are called instance variable because each instance of this class, that is each object, has their own values for these. All right. So birthday would be an example of an instance variable for person, right? Because each person has their own birthday associated with it. Well, each meal has its own cost, and each meal has its own level of service. So those are attributes of that member of the meal entity. Those are made private. It's good programming practice to make your attributes private. All right? Now, depending on, you know historically how you've done in other classes and you may, you may have done some .NET stuff or whatever. That isn't always the case, but it's best to make attributes private. That allows us to have control over the manner in which they're set. So, again, we're never going, to, or we're going to make our attributes private so that we control how those get accessed via our methods. All right. I don't do it in this particular case because I wanted to keep this example simple, but I could put validation on here that if someone, you know, couldn't enter in a negative amount for the cost of the meal, right? Because if you enter in a negative amount, what does that mean? That you got excellent service so you get to mug the waiter for 20 bucks. You know, it doesn't make sense, right, to have a negative uh, amount. So we could put validation in there. And I could put that validation in the set method for the amount. All right. Oops. Set method for the amount. And therefore, no one that used that, this class could sort of shoehorn in a negative amount. Because it's absurd to, to say that the, 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 the cost of a meal was a negative amount. All right? The cost of a meal has to be a positive number. All right? If I made these attributes public, then other classes could directly manipulate them. And there's no guarantee that they would manipulate them correctly. That is they could circumvent any validation rules that I tried to put in there. It's almost like, you know, manufacturers of hardware don't allow you to sort of easily get into the innards of the machine and solder a video cable to the motherboard, right? They give you a nice little interface to it. They've controlled the manner in which you, you hook up to that particular piece of functionality. Well, by making the attributes private and by making the methods public, we guarantee that people access our attributes only through the methods. And therefore, that gives us control over what they can, uh, what they can access and how they can access it. So because of that, I have my private attributes. I then have get and set methods that allow other classes to ask this object, what was the amount of your meal? What was the level of service? Or to set the level of service, or to set the cost for the meal. So that's what these are. This is a method to set the cost. It's going to accept a double, and whatever it's given, it's going to set the cost associated with this meal, that attribute, to the argument. Likewise, level of service is going to accept an integer, and whatever gets sent to it, it's going to set the level of service for this meal to that integer. All the get does is it returns it. So I can control the manner in which these are 
accessed through the Getin methods, uh, Getin sets. So again, this is something I would consider um, as just sort of Java or programming review. Private attributes, public methods to access and to set them. I then have a method that does a calculation of the tip. All right. And again, I could put validations in there to make sure that we've initialized things and so on. All right. But again, I want to keep this simple. So I created a method that initializes the tip at zero. If the level of service is one, then the tip equals the cost times 15%. Otherwise, the tip equals uh, the cost times 20%. Then finally, I return the value of the tip. <coughs> So notice that my activity, bless you, anywhere where I'm using that class, it's via the methods. So I have tight control about what the outside world can do to that class. The nice thing is then that if I put those methods in and, and do that, then this guy doesn't really need to know the details of what the rules are. It just needs to know what methods it needs to call and, and so on. Any questions about this? Okay, here's what I want to do for the remainder of class. And I don't know, I don't know if we'll be able to get through all this, or maybe we will, maybe we'll be able to get through this. Here's what I want to do. I want to change this application. All right. Right now, there is a edit text field for the, the cost of the, of the, uh, the meal. There's a spinner control to, for the um, level of service. There is then a button, and then there's a, a text view that allows us to put the result in. I want to add a checkbox for large party. All right. With the thought being that if it's a large party, in other words, more than six or whatever, all right, that we increase the tip um, an extra three percent. So for average service, we give an eighteen percent tip. For excellent service, we give a twenty-three percent tip. Okay. So that's the rule that I have. So that's what I want to do. I want to add that piece of functionality. All right. Let's work on this together. And you're certainly welcome to open up the sample code that I have in Angel. But let's think of all the things that we have to do. What are all the things I have to do to make this work? I want to add a checkbox for large party. And then I want that to have an impact on the calculation. Go ahead. All right, I need to add the checkbox in the view. So that's one thing I have to do. Okay, in the strings XML, I'm going to have to add the label for that. Okay, in the example activity, I'd need to grab that, grab a, a hook to that, grab a pointer to that checkbox. Okay, and then here I'd have to actually make it work. I'd have to add an attribute to the meal, large party, and I, that would have to take effect for this to work. So let's try to get, let's see how far we can get on this. All right. Now, so let's start with the, the GUI, the main XML. All right. This is a linear layout. So if I decide where I want it to put, it'll simply fall in place nicely. Now, one thing that you notice about, well, one thing the way I code is I very much believe in coding a little bit and then testing it. All right. Um, 
I don't like to do a whole bunch of stuff and then run it and then see if it works or not. You, you know why? Because, you know, I don't need a crystal ball to see it probably isn't going to work. All right. Uh, very rare that someone just off the top of their head writes a long program and bang, it works flawlessly. All right. Maybe it's happened, but, you know, not, not to me. <laughs> All right. Therefore, it's better to take a piece at a time. That way, when you look for your problems, you're looking for your problems in a smaller piece of code. So, I want to add a checkbox. All right. That's going to be some kind of view, right? There's probably checkboxes in Android apps. I've seen them. That's a common thing. What's the name of a checkbox view? I don't know. I don't remember this. So we're going to Google. Android view checkbox. Oh, we can look in here. Developer.android.com. Great resource. We can look at this. And as we scroll down, we can see everything that we want to know about A checkbox. All right. So, looks like the name of it is checkbox. So, let's go in and I'll put it after the level of service. I'll give it an idea of large. Android text. I'll call that large party and I'll go and add that to the text. I want to point out, I just noticed this right now. This text view, this first text view in the application, doesn't have an ID associated with it. Is that a problem? Well, obviously not, right? Because the application ran and no one came in running in to arrest me or anything, so I assume it's not a big problem. Why doesn't this guy have an ID where the other ones do? Why is no ID needed here? And yet everything seemed to work, but for the other ones I needed to put an ID. Go ahead. Isn't that just the title at the top of the Yeah, that's just the title at the top of the page. And, oh, it just, it just right. In other words, I don't need to access that via my code. I'm simply putting a label up there. It's going to be that for everyone. I'm not doing anything dynamic and changing it and all that. Therefore, my code doesn't need to, to touch with that. As opposed to this text view, where the tip, where I'm actually calculating the tip and I'm actually changing the value of that text view, all right, I need to be able to point to it so my program can access it. So remember, that's the purpose of that ID, that it's a hook to point to something on the screen so that my code can access it. So. 
Let's go in and let's run this now that I've added the checkbox. Nothing's going to happen, of course, right? Because I haven't done any code associated with this. But at the very least, I should be able to see that checkbox on the screen and be happy that I got that to work. So let's go and let's run it as an Android application. Because I have a device plugged in, and I also have a virtual device, it's asking me what do I want to uh, test this on. This is my actual, actual device. This is my virtual device. So I could run it on the emulator, I could run it on the actual device. Things usually go faster running it on the actual device, so I'll pick that. It's doing its thing, thinking about it, and here we go. If we look right there, we can see large party. Now, um, the checkbox is to the left of the text. Could I change it? I probably could. This is one of those things where you kind of like, you know, you, you kind of, how do I want to say this? You kind of know that if you don't like that, there's probably some property that I just set. And, and, you know, that's a reasonable thing to do. So there probably exists a property to do that. And if we want to read later on, we could go and play with it. Okay, so we have this going. All right, we have the GUI part of it worked. And again, we can check it and we can uncheck it. Does absolutely nothing with the code. All right, so no calculation matters. So now I'm going to go in and... What I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to create an attribute for it. And I, again, I suppose I could do this in, in a couple of different orders, but I'll create an attribute for this, which is a Boolean. A Boolean, again, is a true or false. It's either a large party or not, the way I have this defined. So I'll call it size. I'll create get and set methods for this attribute. That way I control Let's take a second to review these methods I'm created here to make sure that we all understand them. My set method, public void, is public, which means that other classes can access it. Right? Remember, because we've made the attribute private, other classes can access it. We still need the outside world to be able to tell whether the meal's large or not. Right? So we have to go in and we have to allow to have a method to do that. <clears throat> and that's why we have um, the set size method. Um, it accepts as an argument a Boolean. Right? That Boolean is going to match the type of the attribute, right? Because the way we defined it is a large meal or it's not. So we're going to accept a Boolean argument. We're going to take the value of that argument and set the size of the meal to that. So that's going to be true if it's a large meal, false if it's not. Our, our get method, the get size, is simply going to return the size of the meal to anyone that asks for it. And because this method does return something, what does it return? It returns a size. What type of data is size? It's a Boolean. I'm going to return a Boolean. And sure enough, I'm returning size. So I went and I did that now. So now we have to go in and we have to put code in here to handle that. I 
I'm going to go and change the name of this variable simply because size doesn't sound right. Size you'd expect to see like a number. I'll call it is large. And I said something like I would make it 18 and 23 percent. Okay, so now we should have our class taken care of. I do like the way that code <coughs> reads better, that's why I changed it. If size wasn't very readable, that, that you know, that doesn't seem nonsensical, but if large, if, if is large, that makes sense if it's a large meal. Okay. Now, what do I need to do here? I need to grab a pointer to that checkbox. So how am I going to do that? Well, it's going to look like this line. Except, I'm going to say checkbox C I'm going to cast the checkbox and what is the idea again? What is the idea again? Large party. Okay. Ah, we got a little warning here. All right. I got that error. It's telling me it doesn't know what a checkbox is. What? Should know what a checkbox is. All right. The problem is, is that in Java applications, to be able to refer to a class we have to make sure that we have imported um, that class or that package to refer to it. If we look at the things that we have imported, we've imported Android widget button. So it knows what buttons are. All right? And we can just refer to buttons as buttons. It knows what a spinner is. It knows what a text view is. It knows what an edit text is. But we have not imported the checkbox control. So I go and do that and magically my problem gets fixed. I think. The ID is actually just large. Let me look again. Oh, yeah, Android text is large party. Uh, the ID is just large. Thank you. Okay. So now I want to go and I want to call the set method on the meal class to set whether it's large or not. So I can say m set is large. And I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to do what I always complain when students do it. I'm going to type in a C dot. And oh, look what it gave me there. It gave me a list of all the methods that are available on a checkbox. And sure enough, is checked is the one that I want. That's going to tell me 
if it's checked or not. If it's checked, I know it's a large party, so I set the large party attribute in the meal. Otherwise, I, um, it'll set it to false. All right. And now we should be all set. Now, it may seem that there's a lot of change to add just one little bit of functionality, but really, it's such a neat separation of it that this makes it uh, very maintainable. This meal class, which we're using in this context, we could use in other contexts too. If this was, say, a restaurant guide, we could do all sorts of things with that meal class. We could put everything that relates to a meal in that class. Let's make sure this works, though, right? Because just because I'm not apparently getting any compile errors doesn't mean my code is good. Again, it wants to know where I want to run it on. I'll run it here. So I should be able to say that, let's say $100 meal, average service, that should be a $15 tip. And that's what it says. If I make it a large party and calculate tip, lo and behold, it makes it $18. Okay. My suggestion would be, or one of my suggestions would be to try to recreate what I've done here, if you haven't been playing along at home, as they say, uh, but to recreate it with that example from Angel. You can download uh, the example and you can go through and, and sort of test your memory and test that, that you have everything down. All right? Because we really added, we really added something in every component to, in order to, to affect this change. Right? We had to change the GUI. We had to change our strings file for the label for the GUI. We had to uh, change our custom class for meals. And then we had to change the activity to, to pull everything together and do the calculation. So this is a nice little alteration and test to make sure you understand some of the basics of Java again and um, to understand sort of the architecture of uh, an Android application. As you do that, I want you to think what you're having problems with and what part of this seems confusing. You know, throwing a fair amount at you um, at one shot. So, by all means, go and try to recreate the change I did. Look at the example application and come to class on Thursday with the things that just aren't clear to you and, and, and we can go over and we can review them more as we continue. Questions? All right. That's all I had. And next time we will have, from the word go, the correct adapter. And it will be plugged in to the right place on the laptop and everyone will be happy.